If you were in chapel yesterday, you heard the dean of the chapel ask the question, what do we long for? And being the sort of guy that I am, the first thing that came to mind was this uh, white pickup truck that I saw. It had four-wheel drive. It had a snow plow in the front. And then I realized that Trippy was not asking for something like that, but for all of us to go deeper. Perhaps like me, you saw the ad on television. I saw it last weekend, and it, I don't watch a lot of television, so maybe it's been there for There's a young man and a young woman sitting in a booth in a restaurant across from each other, about so far from each other. And they both have cell phones. It's an ad for cell phones. And um, she has texted the young man, her boyfriend, and the text is breaking up with him. And so they're facing each other. They're not talking to each other. They're looking at their cell phones. And this poor guy has been dumped by a text message. And then comes the line, but it's okay because there's no charge for it. And so, you know, like you, first I laughed. And then I thought, maybe it's not so funny. Maybe, maybe they understand something that we need to understand. So it pointed directly, I think, to what we want to do in the next four days. So this Veritas Forum is one of a number that are going on around the country in every region of the United States, also in Canada, the UK, and the Netherlands, uh, united in the goal of providing campuses a space for taking on, discussing, pondering, and answering some big questions. And our speakers and performers and other presenters come from a variety of vocations and uh, Christian traditions, but are united in the belief that there is someone who responds to all who seek him, that a robust Christian faith provides a foundation for thinking and acting locally, nationally, and globally, and that we work best together to find answers to our questions. So I want to begin by thanking my colleagues on the planning committee who have met for a year to plan this, and the students who have partnered with us the last several months. This would not happen without Hope College students. And also those who have provided financial support. If you got a little pamphlet, if you look at the very back of that, you'll see all their names, and um, if you know any of them, give them a hug for me, would you? Our goal in offering this forum to the college and community is to have a conversation about individual identity and then how our individual identities connect by words like friendship and community. The larger context is enriched by pondering a passage from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and here it is. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care, on the one hand, never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other, never to mistake them for the something else of which they are only a kind of copy or echo, or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. So I am very much looking forward to exploring our theme with and listening to all of you. And now I would like to introduce the Provost of Hope College, Dr. Richard Gray. Good evening, everybody. Good. All response. Great. So the Veritas Forum is all over North America. College campuses everywhere. You are part of something very big, part of a big movement. I'm the first person, as far as I know, the only one at Hope College to use up. 100% of his allotted email space provided by Google. It's true. 
the other, a couple weeks ago, I went to send an email and it wouldn't send. And I went to send it again and it still wouldn't send. So I walked over to CIT and I said, my, my emails won't send. It says that I don't have any space left. And they said, well, that's impossible. That never happens. But we'll check it out. So they get on the computer and the person looks at it and says, no, nah, this is impossible. This never happens. She goes and talks with another person. He gets on a computer, types in. He says, huh, that's the first time that's ever happened. 7,538 megabytes. I guess that's a lot of megabytes. 49,000 email messages. I know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm not really too sure, frankly, how I feel about it. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it's allowed me to conduct a lot of business, but I also realize that that's very different than building the web of relationships that we call community. I want to welcome you to the Veritas Forum on behalf of the students, faculty, staff, and administration of Hope College. The way we communicate with others has changed dramatically just in my lifetime, and it will in yours too. This is just as true now as it was for past generations. My parents used to write letters to each other, and they used the telephone. And, and uh, in the early uh, time of them uh, with the telephone, they used something called a party line. None of you know about that. But uh, it was a shared line. You get on the phone, somebody might be talking. Your neighbor might be talking on it already. There has been, in each succeeding generation, the hope that technology will provide the kind of satisfaction, the kind of community, the kind of progress that will make the world a better place. Let me quote from you, quote to you, a paragraph written in Destination Detroit. The year, December 1900. The author is my great, great uncle, Jeremiah Dwyer, the president of the Detroit Stove Company. He concludes his little article this way. Just a word in regard to the future of electricity, which has made such wonderful developments during the past quarter of a century. It's now generally conceded by close students of the subject that the possibilities of this great science in the world's affairs have not yet even approximately been reached, and that the many new forms of application and use of it in the near future will make it a wonderful factor in all branches of mechanical and scientific if such should prove true, then all attempts at conjecture would be worse than futile. However, whatever the changes uh, uh, that may uh, come after that, it is the writer's opinion, my great, great uncle Jeremiah, that Detroit will always be found in the front ranks of commercial and the manufacturing world. And it is confidently hoped that posterity will do its full part to that end. How many people are from Detroit? Electricity did not save Detroit. Technology did not save Detroit. Oh, it served its purpose, but Detroit today and many other places needs much more than the technology to provide the true community that only people can, can give each other. With each passing generation, there have been technical advances that have made talking to others easier and listening to them harder. You're going to hear from some very well-informed and thought-provoking speakers over the next few days that are going to help you better place the practice of digital connectivity alongside the imperative for biblical hospitality and recognizing ourselves as unique creations of a loving God. I want to just thank very much the organizing committee of this event, Mark Baer, Josh Banner, James Herrick, Mark Husbands, Kristen Johnson, Trigvi Johnson, and Karen Nordell Pearson. 
Each student in this room is lucky to have them as a professor. Welcome to the Veritas Forum. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, before I do that, because I'm a historian, I'm compelled to point out a historical fact. In the 14 years that those of us who have organized the Veritas Forum have been doing it, we've never invited a whole professor to give a keynote address, much less to lead off. So tonight is a truly historical occasion for when we were discussing who in the world was best equipped to provide a theological foundation for what it is we're going to talk about over these four days. We looked across the room and we invited Mark Husbands. Professor Husbands holds the Leonard and Marjorie Moss Chair in Reformed Theology and is Associate Professor of Religion at Oak College. If you don't know it, he's an import from Canada with an undergraduate degree in Religious Studies from York University and a Master's and PhD from the University of Toronto. Prior to coming to Hope, Mark taught at Tyndale College and Seminary and Wheaton College. His book, Karl Barth's Ethics of Prayer, is forthcoming from Westminster John Knox Press. Mark has also edited seven other books, authored 17 articles or essays, and I counted this afternoon, has presented 24 papers and lectures, so if I'm counting correctly, I have a history major. This is number 25, so it's also a historical occasion. What's most impressive about his work is the vast range of subjects that he has considered. Calvin, consumerism, theology, biography, worship, gender, music, medicine, popular culture, art, as well as all three members of the Trinity. All this is preparation for his address tonight, whose title you see behind me. One last thing, Mark is also a very good preacher. I know this because this past summer I sat in the second row of Central Park Chapel because I wanted to hear him speak before I was courageous enough to have him here before you, and I'll let you know he passed the test. Would you join me in welcoming Professor Mark Husbands? by the name of Gandalf. Gandalf rehearses how this ring turned Smeagol or Gollum mad, to which Frodo anxiously responds, what a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Pity, Gandalf replies. It was pity that stayed his hand, pity and mercy, not to strike without need. Let's, as we begin this evening, let's watch a tiny segment of this clip. Speak of life and sad story. Yes, speak of me, but not good. Before the ring found him. Before it drove him mad. It's a pity Pilbara didn't kill him when he had the chance. Pity? It was pity that slain Pilbara's hand. Many that lived to serve death, some that died to serve life. Can you give it to the Frodo? Do not be too eager to deal out death and 
a live option. Today, even for the most earnest, belief in God is deeply felt to be only one possibility among others. Listen to the way Taylor captures this point. I may find it inconceivable that I would abandon my faith, but there are others, including possibly some very close to me, who have no faith, at least not in God or the transcendent. Belief in God is no longer axiomatic. There are alternatives. And this will also likely mean that at least in certain milieu, it may be hard to sustain one's faith. There will be people who feel bound to give it up, even though they mourn its loss. This has been a recognizable experience in our societies, at least since the mid-19th century. There will be many others to whom faith never even seems an eligible possibility. There are certain millions today of whom this is true. Now, the British journalist, Peter Hitchens, brother of the avowed atheist Christopher Hitchens, characterizes the profound and marked shift from a largely Christian culture to a now secular culture in the following clip. This country ceased to be truly Christian in terms of people genuinely, consciously, and in an educated way believing in the Christian faith after the First World War. People still continue to behave as if they're Christians. The society continues to function as if it's a Christian society for some time after it's gone. We've been living in the past 40 or 50 years in the afterglow of Christianity, but eventually, eventually the darkness falls. to be truly honest, we must be willing to countenance the fact that we in the West have been toiling in the waving light of Christianity. And as Peter Hitchens worries, eventually, eventually the darkness falls. Taylor Hitchens and I all agree. We currently live in an age in which Christian belief is very difficult to sustain. Moreover, the secular age makes it doubly or triply challenging to find true friends with whom to share our deepest convictions about the world. If you're still somewhat unconvinced about the rather devastating social and cultural analysis lying behind this assertion, the assertion that we live in a secular age, I hope to rem uh, remove some of your skepticism as I draw back the curtain on an important segment of the American population called emerging adults. A portion of our time this evening will be given over to closely examining a demographic of the population in America between the ages of 18 to 29, called emerging adults. The reason to seek a better understanding of emerging adulthood is that the lives and commitments of these, young, of these people offer us a painfully clear reflection of the secular age in which we live. The central thesis that I will prosecute this evening is this. Ours is a disenchanted world in which the bond of knowledge and love has been severed, resulting in a situation in which emerging adults are cast back upon themselves, no longer able to see that identity is a gift of the triune God manifest in sharing common objects of love. We will need the wise counsel of a number of figures in order to properly defend even the slimmest account of this claim. Chief among the companions shall be the Polish-speaking poet Czesław Miłosz and a Latin-speaking bishop from North Africa, St. Augustine. So, point one. There's three points that makes it easy. Emerging adults and the crisis of knowledge and value. Emerging adulthood is distinguished by relative independence from social roles and from normative expectations. Having left the dependency of childhood and adolescence, and having not yet entered the enduring responsibilities that are normative in adulthood, emerging adults often explore a variety of possible life directions in love, work, and worldviews. And of course, given that we're at an academic institution, we could have added, and majors. 
So this is the definition of emerging adulthood by Jeffrey Jensen Arnott. He coined the phrase in a journal article called Emerging Adulthood, a Theory of Development from the Late Teens through the Twenties. It's revealing that the leading demographic markers of this population are individualistic measures of significance. One, accepting responsibility for oneself. Two, making autonomous decisions. And three, becoming financially independent. Now, absolutely key to this period of growth is the subjective sense of autonomy, of being able to exercise one's freedom and will in the service of charting your own path in life. Now, given all of this, we shouldn't be surprised to learn that emerging adults experience a very difficult time finding a sense of identity and belonging. According to Christian Smith, a prominent sociologist whose extraordinarily nuanced cultural and social analysis is published in a book called Souls in Transition, The Religions, or Religious and Spiritual Lives of Emerging Adults. Now, Smith builds upon Arnott's work and argues that emerging adulthood is a period of life in which young adults experienced a pronounced sense of freedom with very few guidelines to mark the way. Most of them, Smith writes, are at pains to keep open as many options as possible, to honor all forms of social and cultural diversity without judgment, that's bad, or even evaluation, that's very bad. And as quickly as possible, to get on the road to autonomous self-sufficiency. I could editorialize, that's largely impossible. There Little of this, he goes on, encourages them to put down roots within particular religious communities that engage in committed faith practices. Okay. Smith indicates that while more than 60% of emerging adults self-identify as being religious, objective measures, such as actual physical attendance in religious meetings or worship, show a dramatic decline in this number, with only 20% of those between the ages of 18 to 23 participating in the life of the church on a weekly basis. Now, the minority of emerging adults who remain highly involved in their religious faith can generally be found among Mormons, conservative Protestants, or black Protestants. Given the negative prospect of a generation or two of young Americans entering into adulthood with a profound sense of ambiguity or social dislocation, we would do well to gain a sense of the causal factors that have led to this heightened desire for autonomy and self-sufficiency. In order to make progress, let's consider two related elements of Smith's research. The cultural triumph of liberal Protestantism, and the radically individualistic approach to religious belief on the part of emerging adults. So, point one. Smith's account of the cultural triumph of liberal Protestantism closely follows the work of N.J. Demerith, who in a 1995 article called Cultural Victory and Organizational Defeat in the Paradoxical Decline of Liberal Protestantism, mouthful, convincingly argues that the decline in church attendance and participation among liberal Protestants may in fact be the painful structural consequence of its insistence upon individualism, pluralism, freedom, tolerance, a version of intellectual freedom, and the democratic authority of individuals. Now, Demuth draws this argument to a close with a statement that's truly devastating for those who belong to the liberal Protestant tradition. He concludes that the values associated with liberalism are central to American civil religion, but potentially cancerous for the organizations that spawned it. Adding that such values can be binding articles of ideological faith, but in shifting from ends to means, they can lead to a gradual loosening of the bonds of membership commitment. So, how is this a cultural triumph, you might be asking? Well, the dominant commitments of liberal Protestantism have become so widely accepted in American culture that most Jewish, Catholic, 
And many evangelical Protestant and black Protestant emerging adults tend to speak as liberal Protestants. Now, they do so generally unaware of the intellectual and cultural debts that they owe to this tradition. Now, allow me to illustrate the point. Recently, in the course of interviewing the avowed atheist Christopher Hitchens, Reverend Marilyn Sewell, a Unitarian minister, proudly declared herself to be a liberal Christian. Only, it turns out, to be schooled in the essential doctrines of the faith by the atheist Christopher Hitchens. Tragically, the cultural triumph of liberal Protestantism 
has aided the disenchantment of the secular age, and by maintaining its doctrinaire commitment to individual autonomy, it's thereby consigned a generation of emerging adults to a life of unfettered freedom with little direction. Second, the current crisis of knowledge and value is intensified by the radically individualistic approach to religious belief on the part of emerging adults. Lacking any real argument to substantiate the claim, the majority of emerging adults have come to the judgment that religious commitments are all relative and that no one can finally know what, which religious tradition is true. Smith concludes that the personal outlooks of most emerging adults are highly qualified, sometimes even paralyzed, by their awareness of the relativity of their own cultural and social occasions. The latter tend to undercut any confidence they might have in the possibility of holding true beliefs, rendering valid judgments, making worthy commitments. This goes a considerable distance to explaining why emerging adults are so eager to keep all of their options open. If you can never really know what is true or right, then the prudent thing seems to do be is to withhold personal commitment. No one wants to find out that they rushed onto the wrong train only to see a better, faster, well-appointed Eurostar speeding off from the station in the other direction. Yet logically, in this context, at no point can you truly know what train you or anyone else should board in the first place. When combined with the epistemological skepticism and the priority of personal experience, the radical commitment to individual autonomy inevitably leads to a crisis of knowledge and value. Those of you who've nodded off and just woke up might reasonably protest, saying, wait a minute, don't evangelical Protestants, not liberals, go on and on about their personal experience? Well, the answer to this is, is well, not, not actually. The appeal to personal experience is stock in trade for almost every one of us, from the Dalai Lama to Oprah or George Bush. In fairness, however, Evangelical Protestants, particularly those from Wesleyan, Methodist, Holiness, or Pentecostal traditions, have invested considerable authority in personal, individual experience. By doing so, they've had a strong, but not entirely positive influence upon emerging adults. Now, historically, Evangelical Protestants have rightly emphasized the work of the Holy Spirit awakening individuals to fellowship with God, new life and activism, especially on behalf of the poor and the downtrodden. And it's crucial to register Smith's judgment that, quote, many emerging adult attitudes about religion represent no more than somewhat mutated versions of core historical evangelical theological themes, unquote. Evangelicalism intuitionism and populist tendencies have found significant resonance among the subjective sensibilities of emerging adults. Unfortunately, these same commitments effectively undermine a commitment to the authority of scripture and the need to cultivate the life of the mind for the glory of God. What do I mean? When, for instance, emerging adults insist that religion ought to be a strictly individual or personal matter, unblemished by the supposed narrow and offensive rules of religious institutions, or when they claim that truth is determined by reference to one's deeply held feelings and personal experience, they unwittingly pay great homage to the strong anti-institutional character and intuitionism of American evangelicalism. Finally, when emerging adults imagine that the real value of religious faith has to do with its practical morality. It is tapping into the same hope for moral transformation that lies at the heart of the evangelical insistence upon conversion, forgiveness of sin, and God's summons to live a holy life. Smith is keenly alert to the problem here. When evangelical Protestants imagine that salvation is first and foremost about individual, 
structurally unmediated and personally transformative experience, they convey the sense that the most important element of the Christian faith is not God, but the subjective experience and the good that faith brings to each individual. Smith effectively sums up this point in the following statement. Religious faith becomes good if and because it makes people do better, if it helps them live moral lives. Now, of course, that's not Smith's personal view. It's his understanding of how an ersatz pseudo evangelical tradition uh, leads us and emerging adults to this view. Reducing God to an effective instrument or means by which one achieves a deeply personal sense of moral renovation is widely accepted among emerging adults for whom religious faith has some traction. This instrumental account of religion is not properly authentic or evangelical. Rather, it is exactly what you should expect to find from those who prefer their grace, to quote Flannery O'Connor, warm and binding, not dark and disruptive. The critical moral disadvantage of all this for emerging adults is this. When personal experience is the measure of meaning and moral judgment, one is left with no alternative but to do whatever brings about the greatest amount of individual pleasure. Of course, this can also have quite profound negative effects on one's capacity for truly positive life outcomes. Not to mention the unforeseen damage that one can inflict upon others in the course of pursuing personal enjoyment. The crisis of knowledge and value among emerging adults lies here. Those who happen to excel at this game, if you can call it that, are those who, seeking personal satisfaction and autonomy, swiftly travel through their twenties, like psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually ultralight hikers, carrying as little emotional, physical, or relational baggage as possible. In the face of this evocative image of experientially rich, yet spiritually and morally barren emerging adults, I think it's important that I offer you an alternative. Having sought to close the doors upon the insufficiently self-critical affirmations of individual freedom, tolerance, and diversity among liberal Protestants, and the equally indiscriminating acceptance of the appeal to personal individual experience untethered from the most substantial versions of evangelical theology and intellectual life, it's necessary to look beyond these traditions if we ever hope to recover the kind of theological and cultural resources that will help us to embody faithfulness and gratitude for the time that has been given us. The way forward, I suggest, is first to determine what would it look like to be a person of serious religious faith in the midst of a disenchanted secular age. If this is possible, as I believe it is, we need to ask not only what might we do in this age, but who are we? And how might we rediscover a sense of identity and belonging? In order to accomplish all of this, let us turn our attention to the poetry and thought of Cheswa Miwash before finally finding our way to Augustine. Point two, Cheswa Miwash. In 1980, the poet Cheswa Miwash was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature and, commended as, and he was commended for being one who, with uncompromising clear-sightedness, voices man's exposed condition in a world of severe conflicts. Like the many facets of a rare stone, Miwash's work depicts the harrowing character and shape of our secular age. Yet the reason why emerging adults ought to pay particularly close attention to his work is that in spite of the brokenness, despair, disenchantment, and nihilism of the 20th century and 21st, Miwash insists upon speaking of the world as the object of God's love, covenant, and providential care. This is why time and time again, Miwash insists upon the remarkable importance of concrete creaturely reality. 
by offering us the promise of a real world, not that of our imagination or social construction, Miwash protests against the tenor and milieu of the secular age. And in so doing, he opens up a field of vision through which we might yet again recover a sense that the world has not been lost or caught up on a field of battles between blind forces. When Adorno and Levinas insisted that the Holocaust marked the end of culture and the point at which God abandoned humanity, Miwash, living in Warsaw in 1943, wrote lyric verse in the face of the staggering evil of the Holocaust. But I have written uh, under the Nazi occupation in 1943, but uh, a long poem composed by short poems in quadrants, primers quadrants, the world. And this is a work, this is a, and that was written against the horror surrounding me at that time, against the horror of uh, really hell of the Nazi occupation. Uh, it's a sort of the world as it should be, but which is not. In this long poem titled The World, written in Warsaw 1943, one stumbles across three beautiful expositions of the gospel virtues of faith, hope, and love. Now Miwash is not offering us an anodyne civilization against which he often protests. No, as Miwash expresses it, these gentle verses were written in the midst of horror in order to declare themselves for life. Look at his consideration of love. He writes, love means to learn to look at yourself the way one looks at distant things. For you are only one thing among many. And whoever sees that way heals his heart without knowing it from various ills. A bird and a tree say to him, friend. Then he wants us, then he wants us use himself in things so that they stand in the glow of ripeness. It doesn't matter whether he knows what he serves. Who serves best doesn't always understand. Now, in fairness, the evil of the Holocaust is indeed represented in Miwash's poetry, as his poem Campo dei Fiori shows. Listen to the sixth and final stanza. But that day I thought only of the loneliness of the dying, of how when Giordano climbed to his burning he could not find in any human tongue words for mankind, mankind who live on. Those dying here, the lonely forgotten by the world, our tongue becomes for them the language of an ancient planet, until when all is legend and many years have passed, on a new Campo dei Fiori, rage will kindle at a poet's word. Living among contemporaries who had long since given up on the notions of objective truth, belief in heaven and hell, Miwash knew that a Christian understanding of providence, redemption and history was utterly lost to many of his friends. In fact, so foreign was Christianity to his intellectual and cultural milieu that he felt ashamed to speak of Christianity. If nothing else, this experience of shame impressed upon him the great distance between himself and his contemporaries. Borrowing a phrase from Theodore Rotka, Miwash characterizes the way the world must seem to many of his contemporaries as a secular age. Quote, that dark world where gods have lost their way. Yet, Miwash did not fall victim to ideology, delusion, nihilism, self-righteousness, or despair. This would be to reject a properly Christian vision of the world. 
In this world in which evil has its relative but not final power, the poet is, caused to, is called to use her modest gifts in the hope all may come to know the love of God and grow into the fullness of maturity, standing in the glow of ripeness. The significance of Miwash for a generation of emerging adults lies in his example of what it means to have intellectual courage and faith in the midst of a disenchanted age. With un uncompromising clarity, he laid before the, na the, the nature of a world caught in the grips of secularity and insufficiency of a scientific technological civilization. In spite of the fact that this scientific technological culture had all but eradicated the possibility of a return to genuine faith, Miwash insisted upon writing about the world as if it is truly governed and sustained by the life-giving covenant of grace in Christ. The pathos, compassion, intelligence, and faith of Miwash are perhaps no more clearly on display than in his breathtaking poem, Either Or, gesturing towards the enduring Christian practices of worship, prayer, and wonder at the gift of creaturely life, Miwash effectively draws the contrast between the disenchanted secular age in which the existence of humanity is an accident of history, a mere passage from nowhere to nowhere. He contrasts that with a powerfully evocative image of the world redeemed by the incarnate, crucified, and risen Lord. The first stanza of this poem takes the following form. If God incarnated himself in man, died and rose from the dead, all human endeavors deserve attention. Only to the degree that they depend on this, i.e., acquire meaning thanks to this event. We should think of this by day and by night, every day for years, ever stronger and deeper. And most of all, about how human history is holy, and how every deed of ours becomes a part of it, is written down forever, and nothing is ever lost. Because our kind was so much elevated, priesthood should be our calling. Even if we do not wear liturgical garments, we should publicly testify to the divine glory with words, music, dance, and every sign. Now, of course, I teach in a liberal arts college, and I teach in a building with history and English and politics and religion. That would be a lovely thing to have in front of the building. It's a bit long, but it would help. So powerful is the redemptive work of Christ that it leads me, watch, to want us to regard all human work oriented towards and understood in terms of the incarnation, death and resurrection of the word, with meaning and purpose. The reality and revelation of Christ calls us to a radical break with the cultural nihilism of those who experience that dark world where gods have lost their way. Those who know and confess Christ or to live with dogged cheerfulness. For in Christ, nothing we ever do is lost or abandoned. Now, how could anyone, when accosted by the utterly beautiful and comforting promise of God's love, providence, and grace manifest in this poem, remain committed to the empty promise of human freedom and radical individualism? Well aware of the brokenness and the spiritual forces of evil at work in the world, Miwash calls each of us to fully embrace the fundamentally disruptive nature of the gospel. For if God is incarnate, was crucified and rose from the dead, then evil has been vanquished and creation has been redeemed, set right and made a fitting witness to the glory of God. With this in place, let's turn to the work of a 5th century North African bishop in whose writing we find a number of the most important ways of seeing the fundamental connection between knowledge and love. 
What this means for our understanding of selfhood and community will become evident as we consider Augustine's reflection upon friendship and love. Point three, Augustine on friendship, identity, and love. Leaving no doubt about the importance of friendship and community to the Christian life, Augustine writes, Necessities in this world amount to these two things, well-being and a friend. To which he adds, God made man to be and to live, but so that he shouldn't be alone, a system of friendship was worked out. In the city of God, he writes, there is nothing so social by nature or so antisocial by sin as a human being. Clearly, Augustine not only knows the necessity and value of friendship, but he regards as sin the pursuit of autonomy, so central to the subjective will and desire of emerging adults. What could have inspired such confidence in the view that friendship and community are divine gifts? And likewise, why is the pursuit of autonomy, or as Augustine puts it, being antisocial, a sin? Well, the answer to both of these questions is to be found in recovering a number of Augustine's most important arguments vis-a-vis -vis friendship and the inseparability of knowledge and love. In Book 4 of the Confessions, we find Augustine's account of the premature death of a close friend. Looking back, he remembers what it was like to be a 21-year-old man, desolate and overcome with grief. Black grief closed over my heart, and wherever I looked, I saw only death. My native land was a torment to me, he writes, adding, I had become a great enigma to myself. Greco-Roman philosophy had left such a deep imprint upon Augustine that his most evocative and heart-rending account of friendship betrays a literary and philosophical debt to classical philosophers, Cicero, Horace, and Ovid. Anyone who has lost someone very dear to your heart can immediately identify with Augustine when he writes, I was amazed that other mortals went on living when he was dead, whom I had loved as, those, as though he would never die, and still more amazed that I could go on living myself when he was dead. I, who had been like another self to him. It was well said that a friend is half one's soul. I felt that my soul and his had been but one soul in two bodies, and I shrank from life with loathing, because I could not bear to be only half alive, and perhaps I was so afraid of death, because it did not want the whole of him to die, whom I loved so dearly. Now, as painful as this must have been, it is not, as we shall see, an entirely unproblematic account of grief, or for that matter, friendship. Remember, he confesses that he had become a great enigma to himself. A close reading of this text reveals why Augustine has chosen to bring our attention to this painful memory. He chose to revisit this experience of loss and grief in order to bring our attention to the difference between pagan and Christian notions of friendship, knowledge, and love. Let me show you what I mean. Looking back from the perspective of Christian faith, Augustine admits that while his early friendship had been full of sweetness and life, he is unwilling to call it true friendship. With St. Paul's teaching of Romans 5 clearly in view, Augustine confesses to God that our union fell short of true friendship because friendship is genuine only when you bind fast together people who cleave to you through the charity poured abroad in the hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Continuing on with this prayer, Augustine chastises himself by asking, but why am I talking thus? This is no time for asking questions, but for confessing to you 
adding, I was miserable. And miserable too is everyone whose mind is chained by friendship with mortal things and is torn apart by their loss. And without seeking to betray the love that he has for his friend, he reveals how firmly grief had its hold upon him, adding, miserable as I was, I held even this miserable life dearer than my friend. I would have been even less willing to lose it than I was to lose him. <coughs> now, the reason why he had become so tortured by the loss of his friend is that he had allowed himself to be bound or chained to a mortal or creaturely object of love. Remember, among the best of pagan philosophers, the measure of true friendship lies in becoming what we might today call soulmates, or if you will, two bodies with one soul. Augustine now recognizes that he was entirely wrong to bind himself to his friend in this way. To do this was to experience a disordered love. Coming to realize the danger and brokenness inherent in a disordered love lies at the end of the road. We find it hard to turn away. And so we give ourselves over either to dreadful acts of using others, or perhaps even being used by others who diminish our worth through their rapacious desire for power, sex, status, privilege, or wealth. Augustine eventually came to see why his friendship was not true. Lacking fellowship or communion with the Holy Spirit, they did not share a common object of love. Augustine captures all of this with the image of water being poured onto sand. He writes, the reason why that grief had penetrated me so easily and deeply was that I had poured out my soul onto the sand by loving a person sure to die as if he would never die. He finds reassurance by returning to the comfort of the Psalter. O oh God of hosts, restore us, and show your face, and we shall be safe. Psalm 80, verse 7. Commenting upon this passage, he writes, for wherever the human soul turns to itself, or turns itself other than to you, it is fixed in sorrows. Yet again, Augustine reminds us that when someone other than God becomes the center of our life, and then subsequently passes away, life immediately becomes unbearable for the one who remains. With all of this in view, having seen what shape disordered love takes, what does Augustine have to teach us about true friendship? Following Jesus' command to love one's enemies, Matthew 5, Luke 6, Augustine offers us a stunningly beautiful piece of prose that effectively underscores the unique and transformative power of Christian love and friendship. He writes, Blessed is he who loves you, and loves his friend in you and his enemy for your sake, he alone loses no one dear to him, to whom all are dear in the one who is never lost. And who is this but our God, the God who made heaven and earth and fills them? You see, Christian love and true friendship for Augustine is far more encompassing than we might have imagined. Although true friendship begins with the love of God, it doesn't end there. It expands to include the love of one's friends, and even beyond this, it includes the mandate and the possibility of loving one's enemies in Christ. What might we learn from this? If one truly loves God, and loves one's friends in Christ, and such love extends to one's enemies, you find yourself in the midst of a community of those whom you truly love, because Christ is at its center. Put differently, friendship with God demands that we be open to share in our life with all those whom God also loves. 
God loves you, loves your friends, and God loves your enemies. Alongside this account of true friendship, however, lies the equally serious issue of identity, and it is to this question that we need to turn our attention. Our early examination of the disenchantment of the secular age, combined with our extended reflections upon the plight of emerging adulthood, has occurred without considering the basic question of identity, or if you will, selfhood. In a moment, I'll uncover a very valuable piece of text by Augustine, one that will indeed help us to better understand the nature of community and identity. But before we turn to this text, allow me simply to gesture towards a very important truth, one from which emerging adults could benefit. It's crucial to see that Augustine draws a careful distinction between being a person and having an identity. For Augustine, individuals may be regarded as persons simply by virtue of being born of human parents. Selfhood, or identity, however, arises in a social context. Put differently, you may only come to know who you are, according to Augustine, in community. On these terms, selfhood cannot be an individual project and it most certainly cannot arise out of the singular pursuit of autonomy or individual freedom. The key to all this is found at the high point of Augustine's argument in Book 19 of The City of God. It's here where we have one of the finest definitions of community that you will ever find. Listen to how he puts this. A people, we may say, is a gathered multitude of rational beings united by agreeing to share the things they love. There can be as many different kinds of people as there are different things for them to love. Whatever those things may be, there is no absurdity in calling it a people if it is a gathered multitude, not of beasts, but of rational creatures, united by agreeing to share what they love. The better the things, the better the people. The worse the things, the worse their agreement to share them. Now, according to Augustine, individuals move from being a multitude to a people, or if you will, community, when they come to share what they love. Unlike Cicero, who thought that we gain our identity in having a common regard for law or justice, Augustine insists that selfhood, or identity, is formed by sharing in common objects of love. Moreover, when the common objects of love are truly good, then those gathered around these objects become better people. Note, they don't become better people because they want to be so, or they've chosen to work very hard to have a good praise band and, and, and a good, you know, bit of a, worship and a sense of preaching that is effective or relevant. And none of that. They don't become good people because they've affected the means by which this could happen. They become good people for Augustine because they have gathered around and shared in common objects of love. When the object in question is the very best that could be loved, namely the triune God, then a community is formed around God who are given a unique and enduring identity, namely the holy people of God. It almost goes without saying, but the unity of knowledge and love present in Augustine's account of community and selfhood makes the dissolution or cleaving of knowledge and love among emerging adults all that much more tragic. Particularly when, for Augustine, one can only come to know who one is within the experience and knowledge of sharing in the love of God. It's certainly worth remembering, as Oliver Donovan indicates, that St. Paul's term for the holy people of God follows from a Greek noun, koinonia. Moreover, this noun has both a verbal and concrete sense, or if you want to impress your parents, indicative and imperative. In light of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 1.9, we learn that we've been called into, that is, to actively share in the fellowship of God's Son. Jesus Christ our Lord, so that we don't fall victim to an idealized notion of community. St. Paul insists 
upon there being a visible or concrete sense of this term. In 1 Corinthians 10 we find, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Two final points follow from this. First, identity, that is coming to know who we are, follows from the divine gift or calling to actively share in the koinonia or fellowship of a common love in the love of Christ. Second, Augustine reminds us that we come to know ourselves in actively sharing in the common work and worship of the most beautiful object of love there could ever be, namely, Jesus Christ. Only together may we come to know the full meaning of community and selfhood. Through Augustine, we've been led to a deeper appreciation of the teaching of St. Paul, and indeed, of Christ our Lord. For in sharing in the body and blood of Christ, we come to know that we are indeed one people, not a multitude, but one people. Moreover, only sharing our love for Christ, only in doing that, do we come to know ourselves to be the holy people of God, a community of the incarnate, crucified, and risen Lord, in whom we have been granted genuine freedom, hope, and indeed love. Conclusion. Once one begins to see that the disenchantment of our present age undermines the possibility of sharing in common objects of love, in the sense that St. Augustine, the Hitchens, Taylor, O'Donovan, and, and I recommend, it becomes tempting to fall into grief, sadness, or regret. In other words, the age in which we live makes this sharing in common objects of love a much harder thing than we might want. In the wake of the cultural dissolution of the Christian faith, powerfully represented in Peter Hitchens' assertion that, quote, we've been living for the past 40 or 50 years in the afterglow of Christianity, but eventually, eventually the darkness falls. We, like Frodo, might easily ask or say, I wish it need not have happened in my time. Gandalf's response to Frodo bears directly upon the challenge that we face in our age. Rather than falling victim to regret, Faith in providence, in the leading of God, demands that we come to terms with reality and boldly decide what to do with the time that is given to us. In his own way, this is precisely what Cheswa Miwash was doing when he decided to write lyric verses in the midst of the Holocaust. You see, he wrote poetry not to anesthetize his conscience by distracting him from the real reality of human suffering. Rather, he wrote poetry in order to offer a modest, creaturely, and moral witness to proclaim in the midst of horror that the world has not been lost or caught up on a field of battles between blind forces. Like all great Christian thinkers, Tolkien and Miwash possess a vision of history in which both God and humanity bear mutual responsibility as partners, fully engaged in the meaning and the affairs of the day. German Christians turned their back upon covenantal obedience and followed not the voice of the Good Shepherd, but a false lord. In similar ways, when emerging adults uncritically accept the dominant values of liberal Protestantism, with its insistence upon radical individualism, pluralism, freedom, tolerance, aversion of intellectual freedom, and the democratic authority of individuals, we should not be at all surprised to see how paralyzed they seem in the wake of the apparent arbitrariness of the moral claims of their cultural and social location entirely unaware of the strength and coherence of moral and spiritual traditions, emerging adults are left quietly disenchanted, unable to share in the dogged cheerfulness of
of a community shaped by the gospel. Miwash tells the story of walking through a Polish village only to stumble upon a team of ducks splashing about in a dirty puddle of water. He reports, I was struck because nearby there was a lovely stream flowing through an alder wood. Why don't they go over to the stream, I asked an old peasant sitting on a bench in front of his hut. He answered, Bah, oh, if only they knew. Perhaps what emerging adults need is to encounter a group of Christians who know by many 18 to 29 year olds see no alternative than to move about in the disenchanted world of moral and religious ambiguity, while also seeking to guide them towards a true community of people who, like Augustine, know what it means to share in common objects of love, namely the ministry of the word and sacraments through which we encounter the life-given presence and voice of the Good Shepherd. Those who happen to know my primary area of research also know of my respect and affection for the work of the Swiss Reformed theologian Karl Barth. If at any point in the future you feel a bit discouraged or wonder whether or not a distinctively Christian understanding of the world is either permitted or ought to be brought to bear upon a particular challenge or problem. I hope that you will take comfort in the spiritual counsel that Barth offered to a number of German students in 1926. I leave you this evening with a fine example of why thinking and living as a Christian matters in a world often content to splash about in a miserable puddle. While leading a Bible study in Romans 12, and seeking to explain what it means for us to offer our bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Bart had this to say about the cultural and intellectual mandate of the Christian life. There are no areas of which we can say God has nothing to do here or this is none of God's business. It is not true that there is a religious sphere in which we are willing to listen and at the same time another sphere where life has its own laws, where we may not allow the light of God to enter in. But just as the whole is met by mercy, and in the same way the whole is also put under the discipline of grace, God wants and needs nothing less than everything. Let me uh, sort of build a few qualifications into it and then we'll answer directly. 
Um, I, I think your question at its best is, is asking, okay, well, friendship and community mean something. Um, uh, surely justice and the kingdom of God mean something. Surely in the midst of, the, of, of great suffering and brokenness in the world, Christians ought to be a community of love. And that love ought to have concrete witness. I gather that's the thrust of the question. And then practically, how do you do that? I think if we're, we're thinking about um, global issues, this is a great college to do that. This college does a tremendously good job of helping you to think and to give you experiences and opportunities to go and learn about the world. Uh, having a passport is a great thing. Now, it's really basic, right? If you want to think about global issues, have a passport. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to use it right away, but get a passport. Go through the bother of saying, okay, now I could actually go visit others. Uh, but before you go visit others, um, there's, there's lots of things we can do in our community. And first of all, be open to people who uh, are different than you, whose language is different. Um, if you're primarily an English speaker and, and they speak Spanish, learn Spanish. Right? Be with people whose culture and language is different than you. Uh, there's lots of social organizations in Holland that deal with the poor. Good Samaritan is one of them. It's, it's very, 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 um, yeah, they're, they're gracious, they're welcome, they'll have you and come, they'll show you their, their work. Uh, your local church must also be doing a good ministry among the broken and disenfranchised. The fascinating thing is if you think, well, these, these issues across the world, you only get to know them by watching the news. And, and I mean like BBC World News or something. Read papers. Be aware of, of these issues while you're young and have the opportunity to be informed by this. And then um, get your passports out. Uh, go be with others. And go with them not to bring them things you think they need, but to go be with them to learn what it means to live a life in their community, in their culture, in their language. Um, most communities around the world have far more resources internally than we think. And uh, if your, your skin color is like mine, uh, they've been socialized to think that, well, I must know what is right because I have white skin. And I don't. And it's good to be with people and learn from them how do you live faithful lives in the midst of what we would say is utter poverty. And oh, by the way, when you get there, they will probably spend a week's wages to make a meal for you, because they love you. While you're still gathering your thought, let me take out one thing. The paper was a bit too long, but um, I can only give you some small comfort by saying it was much longer than four days ago. Um, and, uh, one of the things I couldn't fit in, I wanted to, and, and how did I come to think that I should talk about Gandalf and Frodo and Bilbo Baggins? How did I come to that? Let me read you a quote. Um, it's from a book by George Marsden, one of the greatest church historians in, in our day in America. And he insists this, that a Christian view of history is clarified if one considers reality as more or less like the world portrayed in the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Isn't it fascinating? That a Christian understanding of history is, is actually recovered by, by looking at the Lord of the Rings and by seeing what vision of the world does that open up. And then he says this, we live in the midst of contests between great and mysterious spiritual forces, which we understand only imperfectly and whose true dimensions we only occasionally glimpse. Yet, frail as we are, we do play a role in this history, on the side either of the powers of light or of the powers of darkness. It is crucially important, then, that by God's grace we keep our wits about us, and discern the vast differences between the real forces for good and the powers of darkness disguised as angels of light. 
that is really fascinating for me. That's, that's very moving to think that uh, the world is not concrete and material. And in some of the comments that were put forward in the reading of C.S. Lewis as, as I was waiting to come up, I have to confess, early on in my Christian life, when I was in university, I was a bit really quite suspicious of Neoplatonism. Of, of realizing that, that all too often my Christian friends and pastors, they spoke of the world as if um, the material thing didn't matter so much. And that's why I think your question is very good. Right? But the, 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 the material thing didn't matter. What mattered was spiritual life or being with God. And I think one of the great gifts of the Christian tradition is it insists, as will be the case this Sunday night, uh, there'll be a table. There'll be a, a minister. There'll be bread and not really wine, and <laughs> grape juice, but nonetheless. Uh, there'll be physical things. And these physical things are the means through which God proclaims the gospel to us, through which God forgives us, through which God heals us, and strengthens us for a life of fellowship with each other. And we can be shaped by a vision of history that is distinctively Christian. And I think uh, the Lord of the Rings is a fantastic way to find yourself into this world. And uh, don't leave it. You'll read the Bible better for it. friendships do kind of dissipate, you expect to hang on to them much longer. Um, if, if we redefine friendship in this way, what does that mean for how we be friends? Not just what does a friendship mean, but what does it look like and how do we um, yeah, hold, hold on to friendships and, um, and j just interact at, at a daily level? It's good, isn't it? Uh, if the question is, how, if Augustine's right, um, do we start to live out this kind of vision of friendship? If that's, that's the question, um, that turns out, you know, if you know Augustine, he just like goes on and on and writes a lot of things. And, and friendship meant an awful lot to him. It really did. And I think one of the things that, that I think his mature reflection back upon the disordered love of his young 21-year-old life was that he had made a mistake. He had, as indicated in the paper, he had loved a mortal thing, a person, as if this would never die. And his love was not ordered to that which ought to have been central, meaning the only uh, eternal person we know, Jesus. So that's the case. It begins, first of all, with wondering, okay, when you're young, I think it's very possible to say, well, you know, when you come to college, you're, you come, you've got your bags packed, your mother and father are, are, are you know, wringing their hands, wondering what will happen to you, and, and you come and one of the first things you're worried about is, will I have a friend? And I would say, Grace, Augustine at 21 would have been in the same place at 18, which is fascinating, isn't it? Fifth century now, would have been in the same place. The late Augustine, the mature Augustine, I think would have wanted you at 17 or 18 or 21 to say, can we talk a bit? Can we find a way for you to now begin to live as a Christian in your friendship? And to do so is perhaps to begin by praying, dear God, not give me a friend, but dear God, can I be someone who loves you so deeply that I will be shaped by you I will grow and have the virtues of a Christian life that may, maybe possibly I could be a good friend for another because I will first love you and that they will be a good friend and a true friend because they also love you and you will be at the center of our life. And that should sustain us. And then the question that Grace asked is, what do you do when you, you leave college and and will Facebook be enough to keep you going? 
which, you know, quite frankly, I told some of my students that I was coming to give this talk and I gave the title and everything, and I said, look, I'm doing a bit of Christian theology and poetry and cultural analysis. Everyone else is doing technology. At one level, that just seems so much more exciting. Uh, but I kind of knew that, you know, what I covered here was going to help. Facebook won't help. But Augustine was aware of the problem because once he became bishop, he was removed from one community, now had to look after others, and he knew other Christians whom he loved dearly were not present with him. And his answer to that dilemma is, although you feel the loss, and although it's nice to receive letters or emails or texts or tweets from them, because Christ is at the center of your love, even though they be removed from you at a distance, you still remain in an enduring fellowship of love. The very thing that sustains you sustains them. And I think when you come to communion, you should, as you eat and share this meal, be aware that you do so with every other Christian in the world. You are in living fellowship with them. And pray that in the midst of the, your new community, that God will also enable you to find people who are so moved by Christ that they invite you over for a meal and feed you and take an interest in you. That would help. The deal of the chapel. Dr. Husbands, first I just want to say thank you for your very wise and thought-provoking and honest lecture. I think your assessment of the cultural analysis helped at least me put some um, hooks on the wall that hang some things on. And one of the things, um, as a pastor, trying to help people think about identity that was helpful for me to think about tonight um, is, as Augustine pointed out, that identity is formed not as isolated individuals, but in community. And But not just kind of coffee shop, Starbucks, third place kind of community, but, but a community of people who share common objects of love. And as Augustine pointed out, that the real friendship, Christian friendship, takes place in that context when we have the common uh, love of, of God, and specifically of the revelation of Christ, and all that Christ comes to redeem, which is this world, which is partly why we're here at school, but think about this world. So all that preamble is to my question, how, how can we cultivate not as individuals at Hope College, but as a community, a Christian community, um, as an intellectual community, in developing an intellectual life. How do we do that as Christians as an act of dog and cheerfulness as the darkness falls in the West? Um, what are the possibilities for us as a community? What are some of the habits we need to, to do to experience that? And, and what, what might that open up for us? So that's the question. Very, very good. Um, I think there would be one or two things to get us going. What I tried to do in the paper was to, to as Dean and Chapman indicated, to be really quite as honest as I could about the way in which I think the world has taken its shape. By that I mean to be blunt and to say, we have to be open to the possibility that we now live in a secular age, a post-Christian culture. Uh, in, in the 20 pages or so that I, I threw away, there was reference to world Christianity, which is to say, when you get your passport stamped and go to the global south, more often than not, more than you can imagine, you will find yourselves among rich, vital Christian communities. And so isn't it fascinating? Oftentimes among people who have very little, but who have the love of Christ, you find deep, rich, vital communities. How do they do it? One very simple lesson is they uh, listen to scripture. And they listen to it as if God is speaking to us now, in this very context, so that 
How, what does it mean for you? Well, some of you are belong to Bible studies. Some of you uh, lead them. Uh, here's a standard white evangelical kind of pattern is you have a passage, you say, okay, what does it say? You say, okay, you read that bit, good. And then you go, what does it mean? And you go, well, that's tricky. And then you're waiting for the really good bit, right? Which is, what does it mean to you? And by that, the people leading the group actually, what does it mean to you as an individual? What did you in your, through imagination, your experience, how did this connect with your heart? How is this relevant to you on your terms? How does it make you feel? How can you make this thing meaningful for you? And you're not going to get that in the global south. Not really. You'll get people who want personal faith, no doubt, and individual <coughs> faith, and have, have it in handfuls. But you're not going to get that to the exclusion of a community. And, and maybe the first answer is to say, if friendship is first a life with God, and then an overwhelming sense that I am the object of God's love, but I only know who I am by sharing this love in community, then to be really, really strict about individualism, and to be really strict about this idea that you have individual freedom, and no one can call you on that. It is yours. You cannot take it from me really strict by that and say, that's not Christian. I might have it by virtue of the Constitution or the UN Declaration of Human Rights. I might have much of this, but it can't be first. It, it has to be subordinate to a Christian understanding of identity, which is, I have these gifts. I offer them to you. How are we together as God's people sharing in these gifts? That means, doesn't it, that uh, when you think of worship, it cannot be about what you are going to get out of this as an individual. It has to be, how will, may we as God's people glorify God? How may we learn what it means to confess our sin and to hear the words of God's forgiveness for God's people? And then to ask, how are we sustained by God's word and ministry and sacrament? But then, to be open and, and have your ears pricked for the benediction where you are sent out into the world to share what has been known among us with others. So in short, individualism will ruin you. You will come to know who you are and to have life within the body of Christ. I think that's really, really hard given everything I've said tonight. It's going to ask you to think about your life in a tremendously different way. And I, I think it's probably good to say, I can't do this alone. I need others who will also help me and encourage me. And then when you read scripture together, ask, what is God saying to us so that we might be a witness and share in the ministry of God's word within the world? Sorry. Yes. Um, I'm glad that Trick went first because my question sort of riffs off what you just said and it concerns the, um, I think, false dichotomy that many particular young adults um, observe when individualism is brought up and that is the, the, the seemingly distinct decision of indivi individualism versus authority. Yeah. authority. Uh, individualism versus Authority. Okay. And how what we've been talking about tonight has not been authority so much as community. And I was sort of curious to hear your thoughts on how Christian authority and Christian community can interact with each other in the sense that um, the, the 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 you know opposite of individualism is not always authority, but in this case it appears to be um, community. Okay. Let's say that you um, have fallen in love, and that you, you know, tomorrow night are sitting in butchers, candlelight, beautiful, she's fantastic, uh, you're dressed up well, and um, someone comes to you 
with that, the cloth over their arm. And they say, can I serve you? And you say, I love that. Yes. It turns out that in the Christian church, when you ordain a deacon in some traditions, Catholic, Episcopal, Anglican, you're given a cloth and it's put over your, your arm. That's part of your ordination. You're being ordained to the diaconate. It is to serve the body of Christ. To serve Christ's people. And now you have an office that you didn't have before. So what's fascinating is when you get ordained priest, they don't take this away. When you get ordained bishop, they do not take this away. This remains a mark of your ordination. I think that's a Christian understanding of authority, is you have authority because through the wisdom of God, shared among God's people, they've seen you have these gifts. And these gifts have to be used for the well-being of the body of Christ. And so you, ex you exercise leadership. You are now in a position of authority. The question becomes, you didn't find or work hard or get through your own effort, these gifts, this wisdom. You didn't get that. This is a gift. And like everything else, how will you be a good steward of these gifts? How will you exercise your responsibility in ways that sustain each other well? That's a Christian understanding. It's so foreign, isn't it? We tend to think that authority is the use of power and the way to get ahead is to rush as fast as you can to occupy positions of power and influence so that you can be an authority and rule over others because no one likes to be put upon, to be ruled. And that's not a Christian understanding. I think maybe that's part of it. Okay. Good question.